Well, good morning, East Ridge. We are switching things up and doing some announcements yeah. at the very beginning. It's a day of switching things up. The it time is. has changed. We're up here first. <laughs> Hopefully, everybody can handle this. Can, can keep I up. think you guys we, can. We have for faith sure. in you. Welcome to East Ridge. My name is Emily. I'm our family minister here. And I'm Daisy. I'm the admin here. And welcome. If this is your very first Sunday with us, we have we want to treat you like a VIP. We thank you for coming and. If you can, there is a connect card. You'll find it in the seat back in front of you. Fill that out. And if you need prayer, there's prayer requests on the back as well. Fill this out. And then on your way out, bring it to the VIP wall where we can answer any questions for you. And you also get a free gift. So be sure to check that out if this is your first Sunday. Or if you have not gotten your free gift and haven't filled one of these out, be sure to do that as well. And then, so we have something coming up. It's actually going to be on Palm Sunday, March 24th. It's the third annual Men's Meet Madness. Woo -hoo -hoo! Woo -hoo! Yes, so I hope you are excited. This is definitely put on by men because you bring <laughs> smoked meats. There are, there's going to be um, March Madness basketball on in the background. There are going to be... Uh, you can read there some other things going on. Crafting. Crafting. So you're going to be, you know, <laughs> coordinating all the different meat and all that. So bring your meat. If somebody does want to bring a vegetable, usually there aren't any vegetables in sight, but you can bring some as well, chips. But um, this is just a great opportunity for men to get together. It's an easy way to, to invite people, bring them into the house of the Lord, and just enjoy time together. So that's the 24th, 5 p.m. You guys, can you believe that Easter is just a couple weeks away? I mean, it is wild how fast it's coming up. And I want you to know that we have several ways that you can celebrate Holy Week with us. So Palm Sunday is going to be our kickoff. We have our regular three services here on Palm Sunday. We have a special uh, thing for the kids that day. It's always a super fun Sunday. We hope that you can join us for that. And then Good Friday, we have a service at uh, 6 o'clock. That's going to be a reflective worship uh, service. We hope you can join us. Shannon's going to be leading that. It's going to be just a beautiful time to come together and think about Easter. And then Easter weekend, we have four services that you can attend. You can attend them all if you want. <laughs> Uh, we have an Easter Saturday option. That's going to be at 5 o'clock. And then we have our regular service times on Sunday. Um, all of those services are going to be the same. We have child care at all of those. So we hope that you plan to uh, spend Easter with mm -hmm. us here. Um, also, if you are new, we have a VIP reception today. So if you've been attending for a couple weeks, a couple months, and you are ready to get connected, we're gonna be in the boardroom at 11 o'clock with some snacks. We would love to just chat with you. So um, stop by after service today and uh, we'd love to get to know you better. Yes, and then tonight here at Eastridge, we have our next phase women's group. Um, it's an evening of scripture and storytelling. And that again is gonna take place right here. This is for women in the next phase of life. And there's gonna be a panel of women answering questions and diving into scripture. There's going to be live music along with refreshments and treats. And if you have not signed up yet and you still want to attend, you actually can still do that either by talking to Vicki over here, or you can still sign up on the hub. But that again is tonight at 6 p.m. for Women of the Next Phase. And it's just gonna be a beautiful evening. So we hope you can attend. And also coming up with Easter, we are going to have an Easter choir. And on Easter, we will be singing just on the Sunday services. But to practice for that, we are gonna have a rehearsal on the 24th. So if you can carry a tune, if you wanna help be in the choir, Please talk to Shannon or there are sign-up sheets um, at the, the new Connect counter. You can find those there. So we'll be practicing on Palm Sunday right after the 11 a.m. service. And if you can, if you are musically inclined in any way, if you can play an instrument, if you have a hidden talent, Somebody here has to. Please talk a to musical Sh hidden talent. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. It has to be musical. We'll we'll figure out a different place for other stuff. But you can um, you can also sign up on the hub for all that too. 
Right, so lots of information here this morning. The QR code for the hub is up behind me. Go ahead and scan that with your phone. There's a sticker in front of you also. That has all of the details for what we covered today. And uh, we just love to connect with you. So we're gonna go ahead and jump into our worship service. So please go ahead and stand. Psalm 57 says, My heart, O God, is steadfast. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make music. Awake, my soul. Awake, harp and lyre. I will awake in the dawn. I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the people. For great is your love reaching to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Please join us in worship. to be in this place today, Lord, 
to be in your presence, to be able to freely sing your praises. God, you are so worthy of our songs, of our worship. It's such a small offering that we can give to you, but we know that you inhabit the praises of your people. That when we gather in this space, that you are here with us. Lord, we ask that today we would just experience your presence in a new way. We love you, Lord, and we lift up your name today. Amen.
says, who being in very true nature God, did not consider equally with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in, ev in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father.
seat. We know there are so many different forms of worship, whether it is singing songs and music, whether it is hearing a message, if it's praying, if it's serving, serving in your house, serving your family, in your job. And one way that we can worship is by our finances. And we know that every single gift that we have is not ours, it is his. And here at Eastridge, we do take up an offering, tithes and offering, and there are a variety of ways to give. Either you could go to give.eccduluth.com. That is a really simple way where you can go online. You can also set up recurring giving there, which is very simple if you just want to not think about it as often. And there are also silver, silver bins around the sanctuary, at the back of the sanctuary, at the back of the uh, lobby, and then also by the coffee machine as well. So be sure to stop by there. And then if I could just pray for, for our offering today. Dear Father God, you are so gracious. As we gather in your name today, we bring these gifts with hearts of gratitude. We know that everything that we have here is yours. Every perfect gift belongs to you. Please, God, help us to steward these gifts, our finances well, so that they bring glory to you and help to bring glory to your kingdom, further your kingdom. God, our mission here is to make heaven crowded, to make your presence known, to bring people to, to your love and to the name of Jesus. And please, God, help us to do that with these gifts that you have entrusted to us. Let us steward them well and discern how to use them. God, we ask this in your son's precious, precious name. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Tom. I'm the uh, senior pastor here. And welcome to my annual rant about changing the times. Okay? <laughs> so we're going to have a 30-minute conversation about how this is awful. It is punitive to people that work at churches. And it is uh, painful. So welcome to the 845 service. Um, <clears throat> so here's the fix. I Proclaim it every year. Move this, if we're going to do this thing at all, move this to Fridays at 4. <laughs> Why are we giving up hours on weekends? Fridays at 4, everybody think, hey, that's a pretty good deal. And then, and then the other way, it would, wouldn't be as good. But there we are. So thank you for being here and for uh, pushing through. If you have children, God bless you. And uh, sometimes you get kids waking up it's just going to be a mess for a couple of days, and te uh, pray for our teachers tomorrow. So, um, we are in the midst of a series called Vantage Point, and started it up last week because I wanted to do more of a teaching series. Sometimes series are more like uh, you know inspirational or influential. This one's more of a teaching style, and so hopefully you'll learn a couple different things you might not be aware of, but I wanted to take a look at the Easter story as we are walking towards it for the next few weeks. Um, Easter's early this year, it's on March 31st, and 
I wanted to take the perspective of different people that were there and their vantage point of Holy Week. And so last week uh, we looked at the story of, of Mary and how impactful that must have been. Obviously, she knew Jesus the best, was with him the longest. And, you know, from the Christmas story and the birth narrative to her presence at the, the first miracle, at the, at the wedding, turning the water into wine, and then obviously, you know, kind of in the background at the crucifixion. And so this story of, of Mary was very intimate and personal for her. Devastating, but also the high of Easter morning. And today, we're going to take a totally different perspective on, on how this looks by taking the vantage point of somebody that meets Jesus that week. The, the week of his crucifixion, the week of his resurrection. And so we are going to be <clears throat> telling the story of Easter through the eyes of Pontius Pilate. Now, Pontius Pilate, in maybe your memory of the Easter story, might just be a character that just sort of appears and then vanishes. Just, you don't really hear much about him prior, and you don't hear anything about him after. He's there for a purpose. He's there for a role, maybe in you know, all the Easter movies you see. You know, he shows up just at the very end. And it's more complicated than that because the story of Pontius Pilate has a ton of context that will help kind of fill your understanding of what is going on during the time of, of the, the, the Easter story itself. And so Pontius Pilate did not live in Jerusalem. And uh, he was a Roman governor that lived in a town called Caesarea. And this is, you know, up north of, of the city of Jerusalem. And he lived in a palace dedicated to, Tiber, to, to Tiberius. And we have images and kind of archaeological digs of that site um, kind of a, an I was here, uh, you know, so we have, it's on that, you can hardly read it, but it says Pilatus. And this, this Pilate stone was excavated outside of Caesarea at, the, at this temple. And so, you know, it's called the Pilate stone, and it's, there it is. And it just sort of shows up. This is where he, his seat of power would have been. Now, he would have traveled to Jerusalem, different times of the year, specifically during Jewish feasts and festivals, and because this is when trouble could happen. And so he would travel down to, to Jerusalem and would make judgments, or maybe there's some things he needed to decide, and maybe some things he needed to kind of, sh let's show some presence, let's show some good Roman soldiers off, like, hey, remember, <clears throat> we're in charge, you're not. That is, you know, his, his job duty at that point. So this appointment, especially to Judea, is kind of on the edge of Rome's power. And Judea would be seen as a kind of a far off, it's kind of a stepping stone governorship. You're hoping to get better appointments closer to Rome. This is sort of out on the outskirts, but you got to start. And so uh, he replaced somebody before him. And that person before him was also more a little bit more tyrannical because the earlier you go back to the Roman occupation, the more that they really had to take charge. And so we, Pilate is credited with around 30 to 35 crucifixions. Uh, the, his predecessor is about 10 times that, just to kind of give you a sense of what is going on. So a pilot would, and the Rome, Rome <clears throat> would have been exposed to Jewish people. There was Jewish people in Rome, but they were weird to the Romans. Now consider, you, if you are a Roman, you're worshiping many gods, you have statues, you have images, you have icons. Then there's this weird little group who, that's banned, 
but also they only have one God. They worship and they have strange customs. They have strange clothing. They, they teach their children different things than, it's just this little group, and now we're going to go to like their headquarters. And that's where Pontius Pilate is the governor. Now consider, you know, what is going on here is he is trying to exert Roman power. And there's less of them than there are of the Jewish people, but they have the, the weapons and the military, and they have the presence. So when he would go down to Jerusalem, it would be more of a, of a police force, especially during high holidays. Because during high holidays, you would have all different man, walks of life coming into Jerusalem for the festivals, for Passover, especially Passover, for Yom Kippur, for the sacrifice, for the Days of Atonement. You would have all of these different customs just arrive, a lot of arguments, just a whole bunch of people in a tight city. It's a powder keg. So he would show up, and this is what's really cool. Um, he would arrive, and he would um, arrive at a different gate, but it is thought that he and Jesus both arrive to Jerusalem around the same time. And so his presence would have been felt at that gate and he would have been welcomed. Rome is here. You know, let's, we're not excited, but we kind of have to show, yay, thank you for visiting our city. And on the other side of town, Jesus is arriving on a donkey. So when he arrives there, there's rumors, there's a rabbi causing trouble. Jesus would have been in the temple already flipping over tables. He's causing a stirring amongst the Jewish leaders. Caiaphas, who is the chief priest, is he, appoint, he appointed Caiaphas. So he's, you know, and he can unappoint Caiaphas if he so chooses. But there's this weird power balance between we, we're occupying you, but also you have your own religious laws, and so we have to pacify you, but we also need to bring you to heal. We need you, we need you to understand who's really in charge. And so each gospel has a story of, of Pilate, but we're going to be taking a look at the story through, through the lens of John. And we're going to be in John 18 and then also John 19. So the Jewish leaders take Jesus from Caiaphas, who's the chief priest, to the palace of the Roman governor. Now, by now, it was early morning, and to avoid ceremonial uncleanliness, they did not enter the palace. Yeah, they have all these weird rituals about cleanliness. And so, they basically bring them, bring Jesus to the Roman governor, and they stay outside because we don't have to go through that process again because Passover's coming. Um, here, Jesus, you go in. So Pilate comes out to them and says, okay, what charges are you bringing against this man? This is a common thing. He's going to have to make judgments. If he were not a criminal, we, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said, well, take him yourselves and judge him by your law. And we kind of have two competing laws. You've got religious law, Roman law. So take, I don't know what you guys do, but... Do the, do the Jewish law thing. Well, we have no right to execute anybody. So he is offended our religious law, but we need Roman law to execute him. This took place to fulfill what Jesus had said about the kind of death that he was going to die. Now, Pilate went back inside and said, are you the king of the Jews? And that's an interesting question because where does that come from? And Jesus says, is that your own idea? Or did the others talk to you about me? That's the claim. Is he's, he's claiming to be the son of God. He's healing people. He's forgiving people. Are you the king of the Jews? Well, am I a Jew? Pilate replies, your own people, your chief priest handed you over to me. What is it that you have done that's so offended them that now you're here? Basically, the question. Jesus said, 
My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders, but now my kingdom is from somewhere else. So you are a king. Now, why is he so fixated on this king thing? Because a king is a direct threat to his power. We're showing up with a king and a kingdom. We've got Caesar. But if you're a king, are you king of these, these Jewish people? Because that's a problem. Because they'll listen to kings, and maybe we'll have another uprising. Jesus says, well, you say that I'm a king. In fact, the reason I was born and I've come into this world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Oh, that's going to, for a Roman, now we're going to sit down and we're going to have a conversation. Quick, let us, let us reason together. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me and Pilate will reply, well, what's truth? How many times have we asked that question even in modern times, right? What is truth? How do you know what is true? With this, he goes out to the Jews again. He says, I find no basis for there to be a charge for him. Like, he's not offending my law. Actually, we're having kind of an interesting debate here. But here, here's an option. It's your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at a time. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? I, that could fix this. Okay, we, we arrested him. He was on trial. Um, no, they shot back. Not him. Give us Barabbas. Barabbas was kind of a wild man. Um, he causes all sorts of uprising. He's in prison now because of an uprising he caused earlier in the month. He's trying to get the Romans out. He's a problem. So they say, well, give us Barabbas instead. We'd rather have him than Jesus. So what's going on here is, are you the king? Are you claiming to be the king? Because I'm the power here. I can imprison you. I don't know, really understand why they brought you here. The, the whole blasphemy thing really doesn't, he, he doesn't care. It's a weird religious law that they have. But if you're threatening power, now you're threatening Rome. Later on in John chapter 19, verse 7, the story continues. The Jewish leaders insisted, we have a law, and according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the son of God. We have a religious law, but now we need your Roman law to take care of this. He's causing problems. When Pilate heard this, he becomes afraid. He goes back inside of the palace and he says, where do you come from? He asked, but Jesus gave him no answer. Starting to get frustrated. Do you refuse to speak to me? Don't you realize I have power? I can release you or I can crucify you. You're going to have to make a decision here, but I'm in charge. Jesus answered, you have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. Now, something happens here in verse 11. For a flickering moment, Pilate changes. I don't know if it's the Roman sensibility of power from a god. Like, oh, I, I understand that. Now you're making sense. Because in verse 12... From then on, Pilate tries to set Jesus free. There's a switch. Like, but the Jewish leaders keep shouting, and almost and in this scene, he says, if you let this man go, you're no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. They're saying, we'll tell. You let a king go? We know where, you, Pilate, we know where your power comes from. We'll go to the top. Pilate switches. 
In verse 12, it's, it's, he tries to set him free, and then they bring up Caesar. From then on, Pilate hears this. In verse 13, he brings Jesus out. He sits down on the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. Now, it was the day of the preparation of the Passover. It was about noon, and now we're going to have a giant power display. Pilate will bring out Jesus and says, here is your king. They shout, take him away, take him away. Crucify him. Oh, you want me to crucify your king? Now I have power again. And I'm going to really display it here. This you can tell Caesar about. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priest reply. That one hurts, doesn't it? To see the religious leaders and the chief priests kneel before Caesar. We have no king but Caesar. Pilate sees that they've bent the knee. He hands them over to be crucified, and the soldiers take charge of Jesus. Now we're going to have the beatings. We're going to have the public execution we're going to have a lot of mocking. So the context behind this is Pilate is going to display what he is capable of. He gets the Jewish leaders to bend. And now we're going to show everybody else who's really in charge, especially during Passover week, because it, the city is a powder keg. Remember that guy earlier in the week that was causing some problems? Here he is now up on a hill crucified by Rome, by me. He takes over, beatings, whippings. They mock him with a crown of thorns. Here's your king. Here's your king. They place a sign above him, Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. In some churches, maybe you grew up or have seen it. This is called the Enri. Uh, go to the next image. Um, it was sometimes on a, on a crucifix. This is just the Latin I is J, Jesus, N is N, Nazareth, R is Rex for king, and the last I is J, Jews. And Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. Pilate's vantage point is about this final scene of, we can do this to your king. So, Sit down. You are occupied. You are, this land is our possession. We can do with it whatever we want, including we can do with you whatever we want. This is a very public display. And Pilate didn't care about the religious laws here. But whatever Jesus was claiming to be or forgiveness or healing on the Sabbath, all of those things he didn't really understand. This was Pilate expressing his power through Roman occupation. Now, here's the best part. Jesus will display ultimate power by defeating death. So on Sunday when he is risen... He will display the ultimate power of defeating death and the salvation of, of, of souls. So what, he, so what Pilate thought, I fixed a problem, actually he's going to create a much larger one. Because now you're going to have a whole bunch of people that have seen what Jesus is capable of. They're going to understand and know, I know that you have physical power. Like Rome... It will still be Rome on Monday after Easter. They're still going to have military power, but they don't have power over death. Jesus does, and we're going to follow him. And so then his followers will actually then begin to be persecuted. Why? Because they really don't like Jesus or what he taught, or, or they're a threat. 
They'll be persecuted not only by, by the Romans, but also by, by the Jews. They, they will be chased out of town because Jesus is a threat to not only Roman power, but also to the religious leader's power. I don't want you to, to miss that as well. Jesus is a direct threat to Caiaphas because Caiaphas is appointed by Pilate, but also Caiaphas and the religious leaders are following the law. And Jesus is claiming to be the fulfillment of the law. And if we have the fulfillment of the law, then why would they need us anymore? Because we're here to maintain that the Jewish people hold on to the 630 Jewish laws. You have to keep 630 laws. How, how are we doing with that? 630 laws. Um, who, who sped today on your way here? Uh, see, we got, we got one righteous person. Okay. <laughs> It's easy, right down there, it's really easy to go, whoa, whoopsie, okay? Even if you accidentally did that, through no fault of your own, you broke a law. So every year, you would have to go to Jerusalem. On Yom Kippur, Yom meaning day, Kippur meaning atonement. This is a very special day. Because on this Day of Atonement, you would bring your sacrifices, what, your, your best thing, your, your best lamb, your best pigeon, if that's all you could afford, your best whatever it is, it had to be a, an actual sacrifice. This isn't, I'm going to bring that three-legged lamb that I was going to kill next week anyways. This is, I'm going to bring the best one I have. And you would bring it to the temple, and there it would be sacrificed, and your sins would be absolved for that moment. Now you have to keep 630 until the next year. Jesus shows up. He sees the temple. He sees, sometimes people can't travel with whatever they needed to bring, so they have to purchase their sacrifice when they get there. And if you knew, let's say you're a, a somebody in the market, and if you knew that you have to have this pigeon in order for you to be saved, I'm going to see how much money I can get out of you. I'm not going to sell it for a nickel if you need this for your salvation. So why is Jesus so upset when he goes into the temple courts? He sees people being taken advantage of. He sees widows and orphans desperately trying to scrape up enough cash so that they can have their sins atoned for. But he starts flipping over tables. Not against commerce, he's against people being taken advantage of. Jesus, at that moment, threatened the entire sacrificial system. And then he claimed to be the fulfillment of the Mosaic law. Why is he a threat to Caiaphas and the chief priests? He's threatening power. Jesus is in trouble not just with Rome, but he's also in trouble with the chief priests. And so that's why every time when he traveled down to Jerusalem, he did it five times, every time was at major risk for his life. And on this time, he knew this is going to be the time. that I'm going to have to display my power. He stops off for a little bit, heals Lazarus. That creates a stir. Now we're going to roll in to Jerusalem. I'm not going to lay low. I'm going to start flipping tables over at the temple. My disciples are talking about me. They're actually kind of feeling a little, yeah, we're doing it, we're doing it. Judas is expecting a major military overthrow. We're going to talk about Judas' Judas's vantage point next week. And in the ultimate display of his power, he lays it down. 
and he's going to take a beating. And they're going to put a crown of thorns on him. They're going to put a sign above him. Now here's the great part, is we know about Sunday. We know what happens. Because after Sunday, the church will begin to grow. It will grow through persecution and also grow through uh, miracles at Pentecost. That's another festival. Peter's going to start preaching and teaching. And, the mayor, and all of a sudden, they're going to be a threat. You're a threat to power. You know that? Because we as Christians, wherever we've gone, have been a threat to the, the governing authorities. Because we don't claim to have any other king but Jesus. That's why it's heartbreaking to see the, the chief priests and the Pharisees say, we have no king but Caesar. Our king is Jesus, and he is more powerful than any other king. He defeated death, was resurrected, and he has saved us because he fulfilled the law. We don't have to keep the 630 ritualistic and celebratory laws. We have a moral law that we follow that he taught us, and we're a threat. So Pilate, even though he thought that he stomped it out, actually started to, to ignite a fire. And this early church and this band of believers, this, the 11 guys that were left and all of the Marys, will begin a revolution. Not through military overthrows. Rome is still Rome on Monday. But they'll begin a revolution by proclaiming the gospel and the salvation of souls. They will change lives. They will change history. They changed the calendar based off of Christianity. Was B.C. or Christ, A.D., Anno Domine, the year of our Lord, changed the entire world through death and a display of power and how foolish we were to think that we were more powerful than Jesus. That's the vantage point I wanted you to get. So Mary was very intimate and emotional. Jesus and, and Pilate, that vantage point is, I, you're a threat to me, and I need to display what I'm capable of. And Jesus said, go ahead. I'm going to show you what I'm capable of. And that's the Easter story through the eyes of Pilate. Like I said, next weekend, we'll be taking a look through the eyes of Judas. That's a complicated one. Judas gets, um, gets weird towards the end. Um, but there's a, Judas has a lot of assumptions. And you might not even know the gospel story at all, but if I say Judas, most likely somebody will say traitor. We're going to take a look through the eyes of Judas next week. So hopefully you can be there. Let me pray for you. God, this morning as we gather, um, may we realize that we are a threat because of your power. Through your strength and your Holy Spirit that resides within us, we can change the world with your gospel. And so, Lord, as we watch you take this beating and laying your power down and showing your humanity, only then to be expressed through your divinity on Sunday morning that you can defeat death. And it is through that moment that we are offered salvation. God, we thank you for that gift and that sacrifice. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Please stand with us as we continue with worship.
bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory, I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me. Oh, how he loves us so. praises to Jesus today. by the grace in his eyes if grace is an ocean we're all sinking so heaven meets earth like an unforeseen kiss and my heart turns violently inside of my chest and i don't have time to maintain these regrets when i think about Oh! 
want to thank you for joining us today. If this was your first time here, make sure you stop by the VIP wall as we'd love to uh, get to know you. Uh, Marilyn from our care ministry is available to pray with you in the back. And um, Shannon, we need help on the worship team, right? We're recruiting yes. for that. Yes, and are. you're going to be out at the little connect table yep. out there. Mm -hmm. I would help, <laughs> but Please I don't, don't like want to overshadow um, everybody else on the stage. So I know we have some singers in here. I know we have some musicians in here. Please help us out as uh, we love. We just need the help, right? So you'll be out there. Thank you all for coming. May God bless you. Have a great week.